You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Hi everyone, Amanda here. I'm just stopping by to ask you for your feedback on the show. It is important to us here at The Dead Prussian to deliver a show that our listeners enjoy. You can leave us a review on iTunes or head on over to our website and fill in the survey at www.thedeadprussian.com slash survey.html. We'd love to hear from you. G'day listeners, welcome to The Dead Prussian. This is episode 14. That's right, lucky number 14. We are doing quite well, so thank you to the people on iTunes for leaving your reviews. We're a five-star podcast in the US. We're a five-star podcast in Australia. And to make the rest of this interview quite awkward, the UK are cheap and miserly, giving no reviews on iTunes. So thank you very much for that. However, I have received a lot of feedback on the survey that sits on the website, so thank you for that. It's good to see uh, the feedback coming through on what listeners would like to listen to. I have got a lot of points about uh, discussing more about Clausewitz, um, which we will do, but I don't want to over-egg the Clausewitz uh, debate because really if I get all the points about Clausewitz out straight away, I don't have much of a show after that. So we've got a broad topic here, war and warfare, and that's why we will bounce in and out of talking about Clausewitz's military theory. We'll always, though, seek to understand the definition of war and conduct a philosophical understanding through reason and rationalisation, as Clausewitz did. Also, just a quick shout-out to the Defence Entrepreneurs Forum Australia. A few of you uh, listeners out there may have seen that we are advertising that forum quite a bit on social media. Please, if you are a junior commander in the Australian Defence Force, jump on the Facebook, jump on the Twitter, or check out the website. The website is hosted at groundedcuriosity.com. Have a look, enter the contest of ideas, and see if your idea can win at the forum on the 8th and 9th of December. All right, let's get down to business because we don't tune into this show to listen to my voice only. We like to listen to some of the guests I've got. And the guest today is a recycled guest. That's right. I have the option of putting guests in the rubbish bin or the recycling bin, and I've chosen to put this guest in the recycling bin. Today we'll be talking about uh, what was read before Clausewitz. As we all know from episodes uh, two and three, the... Clausewitzian uh, theory and his book wasn't really popular until after the German Wars of Unification. So what did military officers read before uh, Clausewitz, before his time and around his time? We focus a lot on the Napoleonic Wars. I make no uh, uh, apologies for that because really uh, they shaped so much of the modern world. And also I can get really good guests uh, discussing uh, 18th and 19th century warfare like my guest today. So, uh, today we have Dr. Hugh Davies, a Senior Lecturer in Defence Studies at the King's College London Defence Studies Department. He uh, has been a member of the department since March 2005 and he is currently the Academic Course Director for the Advanced Command and Staff Course for the British Military. G'day Hugh, how are you going? I'm not too bad, Mick. Good Good to be back. Thanks for inviting me on. Sadly, I couldn't come to Australia for this one. Yeah, I was going to say, last time I asked you to come to the show, you flew to Canberra, but I guess money's tight. I would have paid for the coffee again. <laughs> well, I'll send you the bill for this coffee. Yeah, no, please do. I'm sure it's uh, it's nice and cheap in London. Um, although, <laughs> I lived in North Queensland for a while, and I'll tell you what, trying to find a, uh, a coffee bean there uh, can get quite expensive. Um, thanks for coming on the show. Today, we're going to talk through an article of yours that I found on uh, the Defence In-Depth website. Now, not saying that I was sitting uh, in my study late at night randomly Googling your name and came across an article that's uh, a couple of years old, but um, that's basically what I did, actually. Um, (laughs) Well, that's nice to know. (laughs) What I found interesting was, first, the title, What Did Officers Read Before Clausewitz? I saw that and I was like, light bulb moment. Uh, yeah, the warfare's been around for a while, so what did some of these uh, influential officers read before that, some of these masters of war? I know you're a big fan of uh, the Iron Duke himself. Um, it did take him a while to beat Napoleon, just saying. Um, <laughs> anyone who hasn't heard our discussion on the Iron Duke and how much uh, I don't know about uh, the Duke of Wellington, uh, please listen to episode five and you'll be caught up. <laughs> I, my knowledge is only as extent 
as that uh, actual episode itself. Um, <laughs> although I will read uh, Hugh's book um, once I find a pirate. I can't believe you still haven't read it. Well, it's really hard to find a pirated copy. Um, oh, the, of the, course. The other option is yeah. to pay for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> And, you know, I'm just a poor podcaster, so I can't really afford to uh, do any actual research or reading. Uh, what I did find in this article was, um, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute about, you know, what people actually read. But what I found interesting was the way that you stumbled across this particular topic. Can you just give our listeners a little bit of an idea of how you came to um, stumble across the topic itself? Um, well, it started out in, oh, uh, 2014, I was looking through the library of Lord Loudon. Uh, who had commanded British forces in the Seven Years' War in America um, between 1755 and 1757. And there are a few well-thumbed copies of um, uh, military history books, basically. And in those books, it, it, you could open, open up the book and you could see uh, marginalia. He'd made notes on the book. And I thought, yeah. well, that's a good idea. What if I looked at other military officers' libraries and see if there was any marginalia in their in their books in their in the books that they owned. So um, I got on the phone to my old friend, the Duke of Wellington, um, and that's a bit of a lie. I uh, <laughs> bumped into him as a seminar in London. <laughs> that's and, not that, that's uh, the current Duke of Wellington for the listeners out there. Yeah, not 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 the, not the, not yeah. the dead one. Yeah, because um, Hugh's not a crazy person. That would be quite weird. Um, so. Uh, yeah, the, so the uh, is he the tenth duke? Um, I asked if um, he's he, the, the link is that he's the chairman of King's College, or he's, he's actually just just stood down as the chairman of King's College London. Mm -hmm. But back in 2014, he was still in full flow. And I said, I'm doing this research, and I wondered if it would be possible to come down to Stratfield Say, which is Wellington's um, estate in Berkshire, mm -hmm. and have a look at Wellington's library. And he said, "Yes, of course, no, old boy, no, no problem at all. As you're, as you're a, a, a member of Kings, I, I have no trouble with that. So just write me a letter, and um, and we'll get it organised." So I got in touch with him, uh, and then with uh, his archivist, who uh, invited me down to Stratfield. Say, um, it was actually in September, um, twenty fourteen, I think. So quite a while ago now, mm -hmm. and um, I had a look around around their wonderful library and. In so there's the public library, and then one of the bookshelves moves and reveals a secret entrance to Wellington's private study. That and... is cool. Okay, so this secret bookshelf, um, this was to his private library, and it yes, okay, cool. And so we went, uh, went through it there, and uh, they had. Um, they still got the books that Arthur Wellesley took with him to India in 1797 in the trunk that he took them to India in. So we definitely know that he that those are his books. So one of the difficulties of visiting a library is that we don't know a if the book on the shelf was Wellington's book or if it was added subsequently. Um, uh, and regardless of whether or not it was his book, we don't know if he read it. So we can just make some assumptions that maybe he did. But these books, we definitely know that Wellesley owned mm -hmm. and that uh, since he took them to India and he had nothing else to re read on the six-month voyage to India, that reasonably one could expect him to have read those books. Now, we knew beforehand what those books were. Um, Philip um, Gleig, in his uh, biography of Wellington, uh, did some research into the receipts in Wellington's papers of the books that he bought. So we knew we knew what the books were. Yeah. Um, and I, what I wanted to see is whether or not Wellington made any marginalia on his notes. And okay. very sadly, he hadn't. So it, it it was a bit um, a, a bit sad that I didn't get the opportunity to see any sort of bits of text that maybe Wellington had thought to be particularly interesting. Yeah. Um, but hey ho. Um, what it also gave me the opportunity was to look through the catalogue of um, uh, of the entire library. They've got a yeah. they've got a huge thick catalogue um, with with all of the books, and in that they have noted which books um, were uh, date from Wellington's time, as okay. Stratfield say. Unfortunately, they don't note the date that they were purchased; just yeah. that they were Wellington's books. So it could be that they that he bought them when he was, you know. 25 or they he could be that he bought them when he was 
75. Um, so there's quite a substantial difference in the possibility there. But even so, we can still make some assumptions that, you know, the various infantry manuals and the, and the, uh, and the you know, stuff about how to young officers should should behave, that those are the sort of books that, that arguably a younger well, uh, Wellesley or Wellington would have purchased to read. So books such as but, military instructions for young officers yeah. attached in the field, he probably wouldn't have been reading uh, when he was much older. No, so we can assume that he probably bought those when he was younger, and that might yeah. have influenced the way in which he behaved in, in the field. Um, but that, you know, as nice as that is um, for um, pretty anachronistic 19th century military history, it's not yeah. particularly useful for wider understanding of warfare, yeah. because they're, they're particularly focused on a particular moment in time. Yeah. It's about how you use it, it, you know, how you form infantry for for um, column or square or line. Mm. Um, so it's it's you know it's it's only only relevant for for warfare in the age of musket. Mm. Uh, what I was more interested in is to see if there were any books uh, more generally about warfare and yeah. you know, the history of warfare. Okay. And and what did you find? I well, Maurice de Saxe. I mean, the the the, the big one that stuck out for me was Maurice de Saxe's. Uh, book called uh, um, Memoirs or Reveries on the Art of War. So Mor- Morris de Sax, or, uh, he was the lesser known of the saxophone family with his older brother being baritone and his <sighs> younger brother being alto. Oh dear. <laughs> I had so to do a hue. I, I, I can't do an interview with you without one of those jokes. I was just doing a hashtag <laughs> face palm. Uh, <laughs> That was bad. It was, That's, yeah. I, yeah, I, oh well. Moving I, on. Not even my three-year-old enjoyed <laughs> that one earlier today. So <laughs> let's uh, let's move on. Um, but yeah. talking um, about the Sax and his his possible influence. Yeah. So Sax wrote this book um, in the seventeen forties um, and seventeen fifties, and uh, it it's very much uh, uh, again it's a it's a bit of a sort of drill manual in yep. places but some of the chapters refer to how one should act uh, whilst under attack from irregular opposition mm-hmm. about how you should use your own irregular infantry now remember light infantry isn't particularly common in the 1730s and 1740s so um he's talking about a relatively new and an un- untested concept and he first encounters the use of irregular infantry when he fights the Ottomans in the seventeen in the seventeen tens and seventeen twenties. Mm-hmm. So he's got a very varied career and an interesting man. Um, and uh, he becomes very interesting to the British in particular uh, in seventeen forty five when yeah. he defeats the British at the Battle of Fontenoy. Yes, um, uh, Duke of, was uh, it Duke of Cumberland? Yes, uh, uh, Butcher Cumberland. Um, who goes on to to uh, suppress the Jacobite uprising yeah. the same year, or well, the following year, the Battle of Culloden mm-hmm. in in Scotland? Um, now, what's interesting about uh, about this? We sort of need to take a step back. Um, yeah. There's a great book called um, "Books in the British Army" mm-hmm. by a wonderful. Um, his American historian called Ira Gruber, mm-hmm. and I'd seriously recommend it as just a wonderful piece of research. It's phenomenally well researched, um, and it sounds like it's going to be incredibly dull, but it's really the first a very long opening chapter is really, yeah, very very useful for getting to understand what the reading patterns of British officers uh, was like. Okay. Um, like, of course, I'm British historians. So I'm looking very much at what British British uh, soldiers are reading. Mm-hmm. Now, up to 1745, British soldiers would, would tend tended in general to read military histories of British campaigns and the classics. Yeah. So, if we're going to sort of take a sort of slightly genderized perspective on this and look at the the sort of impact of, of masculinity on how how British uh, British officers uh, decide to construct their reading, mm-hmm. they were subconsciously comparing themselves marlborough in particular but they are the descendants of marlborough within yeah. the campaign within the sort of history of the british army with the classical heroes like caesar mm-hmm. or alexander the great um 
and and then the more general histories like Thucydides, Vegetius, uh, Polybius. Yeah. yeah. So these are the people that they're they're reading and they're subconsciously comparing themselves to, and this all stems from Marlborough's successes in the the War of the Spanish Succession, um, where you know the Battle of Blenheim and the campaign that led to Blenheim is one of the yeah. sort of best uh, examples of British success in the in the battlefield, and. The, the assumption is that the British army of the of the 18th century is as good in 1745 as it is in 1715. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that uh, f- theory is is critically undermined by the the, the, the sharp failure, the, uh, uh, the sharp defeat that they encounter at Fontenoy. Mm-hmm. And so you see you start to see a step change in the in in the approach to, of the reading uh, the British officers take. So they yeah. move away from the military histories, um, the sort of self-aggrandizing, oh, look at us, aren't we brilliant, yeah. to ones that are reflective of continental strategy, to how the French are fighting, to how the Prussians are fighting. Don't forget, this is the time of the uh, the rise of Frederick the Great. Yeah. So British start to look to their continental allies and opponents for an idea of actually how they should start fighting, not not to their own past. Okay. And so Maurice de Saxe, as somebody who defeats the British at Fontenoy, becomes the front, you know the front and center um, of that of that movement. They 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 buy up his stuff in French originally, and then when it's translated into English in the seventeen sixties, they they buy those up as well. So so that's what the British officers that's the sort of stuff they're reading and they're also reading stuff by by prussian uh theorists and 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 you know following on from frederick the great successes yeah. and also the works of frederick the great as well so you see this this movement away from military history to more the sort of theory of warfare it, it seems like which, it's less of a as you said before a, a national self-aggrandizement to more of a critical approach to yeah yeah Yes, which which uh, if anyone remembers my my previous conversation with you, and that's yeah. just about the defeat breeding, breeding innovation, yeah, victory breeding stagnation. It's just, it's in that theme. Um, so, so yeah. So after seventeen forty five, they start reading different stuff. Um, but also in Wellesley's Wellington's library, besides Morris de Saxe, yeah. Um, I didn't quite pick this up. The importance of this initially. Um, but there's another book, um, A History of the Seven Years' War, mm-hmm. very, much longer title than that, but A History of the Seven Years' War by a chap called Henry Lloyd. Now, I didn't particularly take any notice of this at the time, but since then it's become increasingly apparent that Lloyd was much more important than Sachs, even in, in the formulation of British thinking about warfare. Okay. And Lloyd is a very interesting character. He's a Welsh um, soldier of fortune, so... Another reason to be interested in him from yeah. my perspective. I mind Welsh as well. Um, I'm sorry he... about that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm yeah. Tasmanian. That's the Wales of uh, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but Lloyd always wanted to join the British Army. He's the son um, of a uh, of a Welsh vicar who dies. Uh, his mother remarries and his stepfather defrauds him of, it, of his inheritance. So he's unable to pay for his commission into the British army. So instead of doing that, he, he goes to France. No, he goes to Spain initially, um, uh, where he sort of bega- be- begins. He's very well read in military history and, and the theory of, of warfare and stuff in the 1730s. This is, And he uh, starts uh, tutoring um, young Spanish officers and... Um, and as it turns out, also young uh, Jacobites, um, in particular the son of Lord John Drummond, who's one of the big Jacobites of the of the era. Um, and then when the War of the Austrian Succession breaks out, Dr- uh, Drummond goes to war on the French side, and Lloyd goes with him as his tutor. Yeah. And Lloyd is an excellent draftsman, and he takes loads of um, maps and and. Uh, uh, drawings of the Low Countries, and when Sax sees these drawings, he realizes how useful they are. And there is some evidence to suggest that Lloyd's uh, mapping of the Low Countries helped um, 
Saxe choose the ground on which he fought the Battle of Fontenoy. Okay. So here we've got this really unusual situation where you've got a Welsh soldier fighting for, on the French side, and he, he's incorporated into, into Saxe's staff, and and then uh, uh, and so he's fighting on the French on the French side. In the Jacobite uprising, he goes to Scotland and fights on the Jacobite side, and after the failure of that, he ends up at the siege of Bergen op Zoom in seventeen forty nine, I think it is, and and is. Uh, um, heavily involved in that so he's got this pretty interesting career yeah which has uh, which sees him learning from the foremost military figures of the age versus uh, fighting the british so it, an unusual an unusual man in that respect and then the seven years war happens and he he's uh, he actually is part of the austrian staff by then and so he observes stuff from that perspective. Mm-hmm. And then after the Seven Years' War, he writes a history of the Seven Years' War. And this is where it becomes really interesting. So last time I was on here, when I was in Canberra, we, I was at a conference on the hist- New Directions and the History of War, yeah. which was being he- held by the Australian National University and the University of New South Wales, Canberra, which is a wonderful conference. I really, really enjoyed it. I learned a lot from it. And one of the papers to my, um, I talked about Lloyd at that conference mm-hmm. a little bit, um, but one of the other papers, uh, totally coincidentally, was also about Lloyd. Um, but this was from a um, print studies, print, print culture perspective. So okay. this chap, an English literature person, was looking at Lloyd as uh, as a, a figure in terms of English literature and history in in the period and how yeah. he impacted on the military, and what he argued was that Lloyd is the first person to use the ter- the, the notion of the counterfactual or critical analysis in history, okay, in military history. Interesting. And so, uh, until then, most military histories are just straight narratives. This is what happened. Marlborough did this, did that, did that. He beat the French. Um, Lloyd takes a completely different perspective. Rather than just straight outlying, out, outlining what happened, he says, well, what if General so-and-so had taken this decision at the Battle of Minden rather than that decision? So we can try and work out what would have happened and you know, what were the influences on the decision-making by the, by the, uh, the French and the British at these particular points in time and why mm. did they behave like they did? What are the, what are the influences on their thinking? And then out of that, he writes an essay called um, an essay on the general principles of warfare, yeah. which is part of the second volume of the history of the Seven Years' War. And he starts talking about things like national character and um, a national way of war, and that uh, um, you should take uh, soldiers as they are rather than try to make them as you want them to be. And his argument is okay. that each nation has a particular approach to warfare and that should be nurtured, not, not, not mm. squashed. So the British, when they try and adopt all the Prussian drill methods are doing so counterintuitively because yeah. it goes against the British way of fighting. That's not how the British do stuff. The British are much more pro, for example, to using um, uh, surprise movements or irregular movements or, 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 or indeed, as with forces in America, using mm. using and developing light infantry, yeah, and that that, that doesn't necessarily necessarily fit within the Prussian model. So Lloyd has a completely different, you know, he, he, he sort of restructure the way in which uh, um, people think about war, and and indeed how they study history, and that's the first point and uh, in which this sort of happens. And there's this book on on Wellington's list to take to India with him. Hmm. Uh, so it's quite interesting, this notion that perhaps this influenced the way in which Wellesley thought about war and how he approached it, that there's a particular British national character yeah. in, in, in the way in which they uh, he, he decided to fight in the peninsula, for example, or at Waterloo. And um, combine that with Sachs and what Sachs says about you know, how to use a regular infantry or how to plan yeah. a campaign against an insurgent. And it's almost a blueprint for what Wellesley does when he's fighting yeah. in India. There's, it, there's, it's, it's really quite fascinating that there's this read across to, to how, how Wellesley acts in 1800 against yeah. the camp, in the campaign against Dundee Avar. So there's lots of 
interesting little nuggets there and piecing them together is 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 quite is quite so so it, it's interesting because uh, i mean if you had to put in the you know, if you had found some marginalia in in the in the books it would have been no easier but, oh yeah yeah it would have been wonderful <laughs> it said you have to look at the books then look at the general like me he's very very fastidious about his uh about his maintaining his his books as <laughs> uh, you know particularly useful but well, what's uh, as you know completely clean of note but um what's quite interesting about uh, about um lloyd is that he foreshadows clausewitz in terms of the national character of war yeah and that the, the, you know it's almost looking at this notion that you know war is a as a an uh, uh, unending duel yeah um between between um two two uh, uh forces and you know an extension of national policy by other means and stuff like that so it's it's all it's it's sort of starting to sow the seeds of this sort of thinking and clearly Clausewitz is part of a trend rather than a sudden sudden burst in the uh, in intellectual uh, development. So yeah, so it, it's rather than a sudden burst in intellectual development, it's more of a more of a trend mm-hmm. in the way in which war is thought about that that sort of starts to develop to develop in the mid eighteenth century and continues right through Clausewitz's time. And and Lloyd was he was he well read at the time as in not a well read individual but was he widely read? I think so. I mean, it's it's difficult to tell. I mean, there's a great book by a guy called Patrick Spielman who's really good, looked at Lloyd in some in some depth. He's edited an entire collection of his of his works. He didn't just write about war. He talked talked about the history of money and and, and yeah, other so things he's got an as well. Essay, a book on the essay of money. So yeah, I'm probably gonna um, get to that one first, and then just before tax time, and then. Yeah. Uh, well, indeed. Um, and so, uh, 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 but Spielman argues that he's part of the part of the um, uh, the eighteenth century uh, um, uh, military enlightenment. Okay. Um, and is one of the sort of um, uh, progenitors of it. He's, he's really at the forefront of, of thinking, and and very much overshadowed later on by Clausewitz, and that's why we perhaps don't remember him quite as. Mm. quite as closely as 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 we maybe should um but i do know i mean the, the other thing um that that happened when i was in australia the, the, after this conference i went back to the library in sydney and started right. fishing around for um looking at um veterans of the peninsula war and what they did when they arrived in in australia and one of the people i came across was a chap called thomas mitchell who in the Peninsula War was a rifleman, but seconded to um, the Quartermaster General's Department as a draftsman and was one of Wellington's map makers. And f- from my perspective, I was thrilled. I found all of these maps of the peninsula, uh, sketch maps that, that Mitchell had, had drawn. And he had um, had a series of diaries of his, of his campaigns there and also of his map making exploits. So it was really fascinating to see this stuff but one of the books was just a sort of general notebook a sort of military um uh uh, commonplace book just with uh, some interesting you know little snippets like a scrapbook of stuff that he found interesting yeah and um as i was reading this it if there was a lot of references to guibert and thucydides and vegetius and caesar and things like that but um it became clear that the overriding influence was Lloyd. And there were a pile of maxims about how to use light infantry according to Lloyd, how, how to draw maps according to Lloyd, about how one should think about war according to Lloyd. Mm. And I was just sort of did a sort of, sort of internal jig around the, around the archival research room as I sort of stumbled across this stuff. And I hope they've got security cameras. <laughs> I said internal, it was just in my head. Um, <laughs> And uh, at least I hope it was. And um, the yeah, so there's all this stuff about how uh, um, uh, Mitchell thought about war, about and that's clearly influenced by Lloyd. And, mm-hmm. was the, uh, and also about how important um, understanding understanding the terrain is, and clearly that's very close to Lloyd's heart. Yeah. Is, as he was originally a draftsman, and and he talks about, oh, I've got a quote, so I should be able to find it if you give me a second. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he talks about the, the the terrain being the great book of war, 
um, and how it, military history, uh, modern military historians don't really give enough consideration to that, to, to how important all of that is. Mm. Um, here we are. Just give, me, give me a second to download. Okay, so modern historians do not describe with sufficient precision and exactness the countries wherein the wars were carried on, nor the particular uh, spot upon which some great transaction happened. They do not explain minutely as they ought why, how and when every operation was transacted. They only in general terms give the history of a campaign without explaining what was the nature of the ground where it happened. The knowledge, however, of these points is so necessary that it is impossible to form an exact view of the propriety or impropriety of any military transaction without it. So you can see really clearly there mm. the the uh, how important this um, the, the, these I you know, the the terrain is, but also thinking about war more critically. And it goes on to say rivers, woods, ravines, mountains, etc. Together they, they form the great book of war, and he who cannot read it. Um, must forever be content with the title of a brave soldier and never repair to that of a great general. Now, some of your listeners in in, Aust in Australia might well recognise Mitchell's name because mm. he is he was the first surveyor, or not the first surveyor general, but he was the surveyor general of Australia between yeah. 1827 and 1855. And he did four major explorations of New South Wales and also was the person who originally mapped out the founding of the second colony in, in New South Wales, which was Melbourne. Excellent. Um, so I've, 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 Mitchell's statue is, is in Sydney, so yeah. he's, he's, he's not an unimportant figure yeah. in Australian it, history, but it's, it's completely yeah. overshadowed in Britain. I mean, no one knows who he is in Britain. No. Um, but it lends weight so, to his diary as well. You know, if it was just a person who served as a mid-rank soldier or something then it'd be you know it's, it's very easy to uh, dismiss his writing but oh yes but he could go um, he i mean his uh, there's a biography waiting to be read but written about mitchell for you know for more than one reason but mm. after the peninsula war ended wellington and murray appoint him to uh, commission him to, to map the uh, Peninsula War battlefields. Mm -hmm. So for five years after the Peninsula War ends, he's he's touring Spain and Portugal, looking at all of the maps, <laughs> all of the all of the battlefields that Wellington fought on, yeah. and mapping them. And then after that finishes, he comes back to Sandhurst and draws the maps. And then in 1820, Wellington visits uh, Mitchell in uh, at at Sandhurst. March 1820, I've got the quote here from his diary. It's not very long, but it's really, it's amazing. So we don't really have many um, direct linkages to Wellington's thoughts about the battlefields because yeah. Wellington never wrote about the battlefields. Um, and most of the sort of there's published stuff from later in Wellington's life, conversations with Wellington by Stanhope and Croker and things like that. Yeah, But they're sort of, they're forty years out of date in some in some respects, and and they're secondhand uh, uh, recordings that are specifically, I think, um, noted down for uh, for publication. So you have to wonder at the accuracy of them. But this was never published, and and clearly it's just in in Mitchell's diary for for it, for his own uh, uh, benefit. But he said, mm -hmm. so Wellington's looking at the maps uh, that that. Um, that Mitchell is drawing. So his grace said Salamanca ground was very correct and the view very like the town. So there's a, there's a, you know, Mitchell's also a great sketch artist. So there's a picture of, yeah. of uh, Salamanca. And then he, when he goes on to say, uh, he thought the Arapils, which are the, the two major hills, the major, the major geograph geographical features of the battle of Salamanca had been further distant from each other. And right. So this is really important because Wellington, uh, during the Battle of Salamanca in 1812, Wellington doesn't take the larger of the two of the two hills. Yeah, and there's always been a question about why. Why didn't Wellington take take these hills, uh, take both hills? He's got the he's got the smaller of the two. Why didn't he go for the for the lesser? And there's been speculation that Wellington thought that it was further away than it than it really was because the the early morning mist was was disguising it, mm. and. Um, 
and he thought maybe it wasn't within artillery range, but in fact it was very much within artillery range, and the French seize it. Um, and here we have confirmation from in a diary recording, yeah. I think pretty objectively, Wellington's view yeah. that the air appeals were in fact he thought they were further further from each other. So that's a really useful sort of insight into Wellington's thinking at the Battle of, Sa of Salamanca. And he goes on to talk about other stuff as well. But anyway, this is way off what we were originally <laughs> going to talk about. But but it Has uh, but it shows back to Lloyd. Um, yes, um, and, uh, and it shows how how you know you've got this overarching figure, Henry Lloyd, who is who is influencing thinking throughout the throughout the late 18th and early 19th century and you've got two people here who have both read him and they yeah. th and and that clearly influences the way in which they think about the terrain and the battlefields it's very interesting very well done for a Welshman that seems to have um, sold his sword to anyone who was paying at the time well indeed and I, I suspect that's one of the reasons why he never gr gains as much traction as say Clausewitz does yeah. because there's this sort of the this, this sort of smell that hangs around him about him mm. being a mercenary. Um, yeah, Klaus has decided to change sides a bit too, but I guess that was more of a principled decision. Than... Well, and he's always fighting the French. Yeah. He's never he never he never fights for the French. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but Klaus does some of the stuff to, to Lloyd as well in terms of utilizing history and in. In, in the same way, so he does a history of the of the Waterloo campaign, which mm. suggests alternative options that Wellington could have taken, and how it could have been fought in a different way. He's very critical of Wellington. It was published a couple, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, the major flaw being Clausewitz wasn't at Waterloo. He was at the Battle of Wavre. Yeah. But he he does suggest that maybe Wellington could have fought it in a slightly different way, and therefore. Have been somewhat less, you know, stuck on that on that ridgeway at Mont Saint John. Well, I guess it didn't um, turn out too badly for Wellington in the well, end. It didn't, but it was incredibly costly. I mean, what is it, forty thousand casualties across across the uh, uh, all three armies? I mean, mm. that's a that's a, a Somme level of. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty of, big butcher's uh, bill. Yes, it is very much so. Um, Although I would argue that there's not really much else Wellington could have done with the army he had at the time, as you know from our previous discussion. Yeah. <laughs> so. and, and and the uh, the ending of the Napoleonic Wars at the time was uh, probably seen worth the cost, given yes, if there was no decisive outcome at that battle. We don't know how long it would have continued. That's an Absolutely. interesting counterfactual that maybe a 19th century warfare historian could probably write uh, for us. Um, <laughs> onto the uh, onto the question that everyone gets here. Now you've had this question before. So... I know, and I didn't even think about it until <laughs> I uh, until you mentioned it earlier. And I haven't got a clue what to say apart from my old one. That's, I don't, I'm that's not good. sure I'm going to change my view. Oh, that actually is good because that gives us a little bit of consistency on the show. And uh, my uh, wonderful sense of humour and award-winning smile is the only other uh, consistencies within the show, um, <laughs> which so... is unfortunately never on display because you don't do the, the video. Yeah, well, I do have a face for radio, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> But as, uh, as those who listen to episode five know, and those who haven't, I'll explain it to you that uh, last time, uh, the definition you gave us was that war is about people, uh, not stuff, uh, which is quite interesting, especially in this day and age with the rapid development in technology and the way that it influences the, uh, the practice of warfare and the decisions about uh, how to go to war and what we have seen in the recent decades on how the uh, revolution in military um, affairs has, uh, mm -hmm. I will say, um, hoodwinked some people into believing that it will always, that it can become something that is a price a precise affair without mm -hmm. uh, too much involvement of humans. We've seen something very different over the past uh, decade and a half, assuredly. Um, so it's interesting, people, not stuff. It's a definition that's one of my favourites. Um, Hugh, thank you very much for coming on Good. the show. Pleasure, Mick, as always. Um, it's always... Speak to you, uh, be back on in another <laughs> another four months or so. Yeah, so another four months when I take out the recycling again uh, to, see, <laughs> to see how we go. Um, but uh, I'll probably do some reading on uh, Wellington. Uh, probably not your book because then that gives you a sense of satisfaction. Um, <laughs> oh, but I'll, 
<laughs> I'll, uh, I'll see how we go. Um, it's always great to have guests on, especially those uh, from across the sea. Uh, all right, listeners. Now, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I've got a survey up on the website and I need you to give me your feedback. I've got a lot of responses already. It's very, very interesting to see how you you're doing. The feedback ends in the month of June. Uh, I'll take the survey down then. I'll go through all the responses and that may shape uh, how the uh, second half of this year goes for the Dead Prussian podcast. I'll also um, encourage anyone, anyone in the UK, anyone who's listening to this possibly right now in the UK, who uses iTunes to jump on and give us a uh, review. I don't mind if you give us a three-star review. I don't mind if you give us a four-star review. If you give us a five-star review, that's excellent. If you give us a one or two-star review, that's okay. Just don't add any nasty words in there. If you if you don't like the show, you don't have to tell me. It's okay. If you do want to tell me, uh, feel free to email me in private so that I can put your comments quickly in the trash. All right, that's the end of the show. So thanks very much, uh, Hugh, for uh, coming on. Um, I Absolutely. hope you enjoy the rest of Pleasure. your sunny uh, Saturday afternoon uh, in London. Uh, here in... Uh, I'm in Oxfordshire, not in London. Oh. So... It's, it's a, well, a country the size of the UK is pretty much all the same place, isn't it? Oh, no, it's beautiful here. <laughs> the Thames is much narrower here. <laughs> and, uh, and less rubbish filled, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, that was not an insult to all those Londoners that like uh, to walk by the Thames. I'm here in a bleak Canberra where it has been raining all day, so uh, don't think I'm too smug about the uh, normal uh, Australian weather. All right, thanks, you, and uh, I'll see you in four months. Cheers. All right, listeners, uh, before I go, I've only got to tell you one thing. Until next time, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website, www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.